Romans 10, if you would. And if you wouldn't, do it anyway. Um, oh boy, that was good. That's good, that's good. I don't know, I don't know about people that don't like the Bible. I just, I think I like it. I think I like it. Let's see if I can find my Romans 10 in my notes. Here it is. All right, Romans 10. Are you ready? Yeah. That nose piece is just, I think there's like two molecules holding it on. That's about it. And we're supposed to get our eyes checked later this month. Yeah. Hey, that won't glue. It, Oh, yeah, I've done that before. Yeah. You talk about the, the geek kid in junior high with his glasses taped. That'd be me. Yeah. All right. Uh, Romans 10, and uh, we'll just kind of look at Romans 10 and 11 tonight um, in relation to the, the, uh, what I'll call the doctrine of Israel. And uh, this, this doctrine, uh, like I said this morning, uh, you, name, you name the cult, they replace Israel. Mormonism, they believe that the Mormons were the ten lost tribes. Let me tell you something. There is no such thing in your Bible of ten lost tribes. God never says that. God never says it'd be lost. God never said anything like that. Uh, he always knows his people, he knows where they are, and um, the people who say that have an agenda of trying to put themselves in the place where only Israel belongs. And is it a different gospel for them? No, a thousand times no. The, it, even the Bible is going to say, we're going to see that in this text tonight. It is the exact same gospel. So you'll have replacement theologians, like, uh, like I said, the Mormons, they believe they're the ten lost tribes. Jehovah's Witness believe they're all the tribes, but only the 144,000. And I asked, I remember asking Brady when he was a Jehovah's Witness, I said, so what tribe are you from? And he said, well, those are spiritual tribes. Now, he didn't ever tell me what that meant. I, but what he meant it meant was it's make-believe tribes. Made up tribes in your mind tribes. And um, he doesn't believe that now. But anyway, um, uh, by the way, y'all pray for Brady. I'm not going to say nothing, but y'all pray for Brady, okay? Uh, anyway, um, Jehovah, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Roman Catholic Church have replaced, they in their mind have replaced Israel. And so um, if, you want, if you want to look at a Gentile religion that... Uh, basically does away with the identity of Israel. It's the Roman Catholic Church does it. I mean, they have all the prophets of the Old Testament, even the identity of Jesus and so on, you would, you would think that they've been Gentiles from the beginning. Okay, but they're not. They were Jewish people. David was a Jewish king. Solomon was a Jewish king. Elijah was a, was a Jewish prophet. Elisha was a Jewish prophet. Jesus was a Jewish prophet. Uh, Paul, um, Peter, James, John, all these people were Jews. And they wrote as Jewish people. And um, so you can't, you can't take away from that. The Roman Catholic Church. Um, who else does this? Reformed, the Reformed, uh, either Reformed Presbyterian or Reformed uh, Anabaptist is what they used to be called. Uh, those who hold to the doctrine and teachings of John Calvin. Uh, Calvin was a replacement theologian. And um, those who follow Reformed teaching believe that they are the replacement for Israel. And that God is done with Israel as a people, as an, as an identifiable people. God is done with them. And he has no more promise for them at all. That's a lie. Um, Unfortunately, we had a, a young man here several years ago that he moved here. 
to be part of this church, but, um, and I knew this was going on, he was spending a lot of time, a lot of time listening to uh, Reformed teachers. Yes, Seventh-day Adventists, I believe, are replacement. I'm not sure, but I think they are. Somebody asked me that. Um, but anyway, uh, he spent a lot of time listening uh, to a lot of uh, Reformed teaching. Uh, he was reading a lot of Puritan books and reading a lot of Puritan sermons. And um, he uh, came to me one day and he said, uh, he said, he's been learning a lot. And I said, well, praise the Lord. I thought he meant from us. And he said, uh, he said, I now have a really good understanding of who Israel is. And I went, oh, no. And so he um, said one day he wanted to come by and talk to me about it. And I said, okay. So he came by and what he wanted to do was conquer me. Um, and what I mean by that is he said, I just want us to have a conversation about it. Well, anytime I would start to talk, he'd cut me off. And he would override me with his voice and his correction and how I was wrong. And, uh, and, it, and it finally got to, the, it got to ridiculous things like the sky is blue. And he would argue that one because I said it. And I finally just said, I'm done with this conversation. I'm done. He said, well, I thought you'd want to have a conversation. I said, we're not having one. We're having an argument. And I said, it's an argument that's one-sided because you won't even let me finish a thought before you gang up on it and try to dissolve it. And I said, that's not, that's not uh, iron sharpening iron. It's nothing more than your ego coming out. And I said, I had a suspicion that you were wandering off, way off track on this issue. And I said, I'll be honest with you, I can't, I won't have you trying to spread this through my congregation because he had already started. And... Um, so he left a little bit angry and upset, went around telling everybody I kicked him out of the church, which is not true. I just told him that I, I won't let you be telling people about this. I won't let you be going behind my back as a pastor. You're going behind my back to try to influence the people in my church. And I said, that is wrong. I said, if you think that you're so right on this thing, then you pray for me. And if God thinks that you're right, I promise you, God will correct me. I said, but uh, right now I'm not having it. And um, so anyway, that, that just went nowhere. But I know that the Puritan thought, I know for a fact, as I read some Puritan things uh, from a, when they came over to this country, and I know that they saw themselves as Israel. Uh, more so than just... Uh, uh, as an example or a metaphor, they saw themselves as the replacement for Israel, the new Jews, you would, as you would have it. Um, but anyway, you get into the occults, you, or the, excuse me, the cults, you get into uh, various denominations, um, uh, such as, like I mentioned earlier, uh, among the free will Baptists, amillennialism is rampant. And amillennialism teaches that the thousand years is not a literal thousand years and a, a restoration of Israel is not God's literal restoration of Israel. He means like a revival of the church. And, and I can't accept that either. And so it just, it amazes me that all of these false doctrines all want to gang up on the Jews. Every one of them. Uh, even even hyper-dispensationalism where they believe in different gospels during different eras of time. They, are, they won't have a problem saying that you and I are saved by grace. But the poor Jew, whom God loves way more than he loves us, the... Is that somebody's phone? Okay. The poor Jew, who God loves more than anybody, uh, he set his love on them at the first, they've got to earn their salvation by doing works. And I'm just like, I'm not accepting that one either. So anyway, let's go through uh, Romans 10, 11 as fast as, as, fast as I possibly can. Uh, but let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. And Father, you know my heart. I am not interested in just putting forth a position that I believe in and, and making it stand on my arguments. 
just so I can think I'm right. God, I am not above correction. I love this book. This book is always right. The way it says what it says, it doesn't need my help. And uh, I pray, dear God, that you would open some people's eyes uh, to how much you love Israel and how much you love your people. Jesus, they are your brethren. They're your people. You died for them first. And Lord, I, I understand that. I love my people. I'm not against anybody else. But I love my people. And Lord, I want you to save my people, my family, my kind. But Lord, you came to save everybody and you came to do it the same. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for making the cross an equal opportunity savior. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Romans 10, Paul begins talking about where his heart is. Now, it's, here's a Jew that has been called by Christ to be the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. So that's, that's Paul's ministry. That's his life. He's trying to preach to the Jews. They keep running him out of the synagogues. They keep threatening to kill him. At one place, they did try to kill him. They thought they killed him, but he got over it. Okay, he got healed from death. And... Um, so finally, Paul got to a point where he said, I'm done. I'm, when I go into town, I'm not, going out to the, I'm not going out to the synagogue. I want to find out where there's a big mess of, of Gentiles. Tractor pulls. That was, that was a joke. Where are you going to find the biggest collection of Gentiles in this country? Tractor pulls. County fairs. Tractor pulls, go, that's where the Gentiles are, the rodeos. There are not too many Weinsteins riding bulls. That's true, amen. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, I, this, I keep thinking that was funny. Going to go to the Gentiles, going to go to the tractor pulls. I thought that was funny. Brethren, my heart's, John, quit your laughing. I, shut up. My brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I believe God's going to answer that prayer. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, uh, my battery's fixing to go dead as a doorknob. So here's what I'm going to do. Huh? I can, I can handle it. Watch this. It's my superpowers right here. There we go. Let's turn it like this. So, his desire is that they be saved. He knows that they know they have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for God, but they haven't learned what they need to learn they and i can let me explain how the jew looks at the old testament he has been told by his kabbalah teaching rabbis that even if he just reads the old testament the way it's written and understands it the way it's written that's not really the full understanding of what's written there they have four levels of understanding of the Bible, the Old Testament, they, they call it, the Torah. And the, the fourth one, the top level, is sort of like a spiritual, unwritten understanding. If that makes sense, and it doesn't really, but it's like you understand it, but you can never ever put it in words. So in that, it's... it's I don't know how to describe that other than it's not true. It's like uh, when I first learned about the Hebrew idea of the white fire and the black fire. The black fire being the words in black ink written on the pages of the Old Testament. And the white fire being the white space on the paper around the letters. And to a Jewish teacher of the Kabbalah, 
there's more to be understood from the white fire than there is the black fire. In other words, the empty void space of the paper, there's more to be known about God from that than there is from the writing of God. And that is totally upside down and backwards of how God explained it. I am the Lord thy God, and you know thou shalt not have any other gods before me. That's a pretty simple understanding. That's who God really is. And, and no amount of blank paper can describe God better than God describing himself to his people. So that, that's why they will never know the real God, is that they're looking at the same Torah, they're just looking in the wrong space. Okay? So, uh, verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Why? Because they keep looking at the wrong way. And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So, the Jews, and Jesus warned us about this. He told us that the Jews have made void the, the law of God or the commandments of God by their tradition. Here's what he meant by that. By the time Jesus came on the scene, the Jews had already mastered uh, their version of the Old Testament. They wrote, they first wrote a commentary on the law itself. In other words, this is how we Jews understand God's laws and understand how they are to be applied. You cannot walk farther than a Sabbath day journey on the Sabbath day. You can only go so far on the Sabbath day and then after that it's considered a work and you're, you're violating the law. Then they wrote a, a commentary on the commentary, the Tanakh. And this, now they have double twisted the Old Testament law and made it void. So the Jew then believes he can walk a Sabbath day journey, stop and rest. Walk another Sabbath day journey, stop and rest. Another Sabbath day. So how far can he walk on the Sabbath day? Yeah, however long it takes him to stop resting. Because that's what they did. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. They're trying to establish their own righteousness. And, and what they've done is just build in all these loopholes to the law to get away with it. You cannot commit adultery unless you do. And then you can. Okay, stuff like that. Have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. So in verse 4, Paul then now, he's establishing Christian doctrine based upon this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believeth, not doeth, but believeth. He's the end of the law. In other words, the law, the, the Mount Sinai covenant ended when Christ died. He fulfilled all the law and commandments. Right then and there. Party is over. Okay? Can you have a contract with a dead man? So let's say that, John, you uh, ended up one of these widows that you helped take care of. They made a contract with you that uh, for the remainder of your life, you're, they're going to pay you a million dollars a year to take care of them. Not bad. Not a bad one. Okay. But then the first month that old widow dies. You're going, oh, I had a contract. I'm supposed to get a million a year. Uh-uh. Too bad. The contractee is dead. You cannot have a contract with a dead person. It's of none effect. Okay? Uh, so that's what he's saying here. Um, Christ is the end of the law. Verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. So your life comes from you performing the works of the law. So as long as you do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness against your neighbor, uh, do not kill, 
and do not uh, covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, and you honor your father and your mother. And I know I'm going backwards here, but anyway, uh, as long as you uh, make no graven images, as long as you keep the Sabbath day, as long as uh, uh, you have no other gods before you, never take God's name in vain, as long as you do all ten of those things, you get to live. But the day that you break just one of the laws, the sentence of death is upon you now. That's the consequences of the law. So if you say you want to try to live by the law or try to do as much as you can, one law, you busted the whole thing. So he says, for Moses, describe it, verse 5, describe it, the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise or this way. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or, who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? In other words, where he's saying, who's going to go up, if God, God, God said, I wrote this commandment for you, but I put it way up in heaven. Who's going to go up to heaven and get the word for us? Nobody. Well, I wrote the law for you, and I wrote the way of salvation, but I hid it way down in the depths of the earth. Who's going to go down and get it? There's nobody that can. So he didn't do it that way. He says in verse 8, The word is nigh thee. This is an Old Testament verse. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou... Here it is, that famous passage of salvation. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now again, this phrase, this premise that this is built on goes all the way back to the Old Testament. The word is not far away that somebody has to go get it. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And who is it that God hasn't put this in their heart? No one. In other words, God has made this available to everybody. So, verse... 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That's Old Testament verse. So God was establishing the doctrine of belief for salvation all the way back in the Old Testament. There is no difference, verse 12, between the Jew and the Greek. The Jew is the Old Testament, Greek is New Testament. But there's no difference. In how God saves them, is there? So if I were to say, in this dispensation, God saves us by grace. But in the, in the tribulation, in the dispensation for the Jews, they will be saved by law keeping. They will be saved by animal sacrifices. They'll be saved by temple uh, rituals and so on. That's how they're going to be saved. Am I right or wrong? You're wrong. I'm wrong. Because it says there's no difference between the Jew and Greek. For the same Lord... Over all is rich unto all that call upon him. God doesn't check to see if you're circumcised or not before he saves you with the salvation of grace through faith. For, verse 13, all oh, look at here, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a direct quote from Joel chapter 3, or chapter 2. How then... Shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, let me just, let me say something. I don't think I've ever really said anything like this, ever. The call to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ 
is without a doubt probably the highest calling that there is among men. Um, if somebody ever asked me to run for public office, I would say, why would I stoop down to that level? And it's not a boast or a brag. It's not my ego coming out. I, God made me understand several years ago the seriousness of calling someone to preach the gospel. I didn't quite understand it when I first submitted to it. And I was, it was right there. It would have been in 1982-ish. I was 16 years old. It was on a Sunday night. The message was, Must Jesus Bear His Cross Alone? That's from our hymn book. And I didn't, I, I knew that it was God calling me. I, I believed in my heart that it was. I made it public that night. Uh, I even uh, talked to my dad. My dad was out of town. And um, I talked to him about it. He didn't really sign on to it right away. He wasn't, he wasn't right with God then. And he told my mom, I think he's too young to really, you know, know this. Uh, but he changed his mind when I was ordained the night he came and saw me ordained. He said, I was proud of me and that meant the world to me. But the seriousness of being called to preach the gospel is number one, you yourself must believe that gospel. If I believed another gospel and then was trying to teach you something different than what I believe, uh, it would eventually, the lie would eventually manifest itself. Uh, if I was trying to teach you something that I was not first a partaker of, the lie would manifest itself. Um, but I, I, I started understanding the seriousness of it. And the fact that it was my responsibility to say things that were not always going to be popular. It's like I said uh, down in, uh, or up in Iowa last weekend, I said, I... I came here not to make friends. I came here to tell the truth. If you love the truth, we'll be friends. If you don't love the truth, then you're going to hate my guts. And um, that's the part that God knew me I'd really have to work on. Because I want to be liked and accepted by everybody that I meet. I want everybody to like me. But over the years, I've understood that not everybody's going to like me. Not everybody's going to... Uh, think highly of me because I'm a preacher. In fact, they're absolutely going to hate my guts before they ever met me simply because I am a preacher of the gospel. Despised by the world, despised by even lost church members, but loved by those who are saved and redeemed. Loved by those who've had the gospel preached to them and they've accepted it. And so it is a, it is a high calling. And it's one to be taken Seriously, and I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it as a, as a, um, as a, as a job or a, or a, what am I trying to say? Occupation. I don't recommend it. I recommend something beside, you know, maybe trash hauler or something would be better than being called to preach. Uh, because you are going to make a lot of enemies. You're going to make a lot of people angry because they love their sin more than they love anything else and not going to let go of it very easily. But the people who do love you will love you to death. Amen? And so, uh, verse 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Now, I like this. Because I read in Mormon doctrine one time, and I was, trying, I was going through Mormon doctrine to, to really prove Bradley wrong. Is that that time Bradley and Brady were calling me? Bradley was the Mormon. And I read in Mormon doctrine that Mormons can expect uh, their eternity filled with happiness and joy in the celestial kingdom if they obey the gospel. Now, their version of obeying the gospel is like this. And, this, and there's a lot of quotes on this from, from Mormon writers and Mormon apostles. That you, that you obey what God said, and after having done all that you can do, then God begins to apply grace to your life 
after you have done all you can do. They keep repeating that same phrase over and over again. After you've done everything possible that you can do, then God uh, applies grace to your life and saves you. Where is, where is that written, number one? Number two, what if somebody can do almost nothing? Will God still save them? If they believe. See, God's version of, of obeying the gospel is in verse 16 here. Lord, who hath believed our report? That's Isaiah 53. That's the first verse in Isaiah 53. Lord, who hath be, believed our, port, our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord, uh, to, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then it goes on to describe Jesus on the cross. So, believing what God said is obeying the gospel. The commandment is to believe, not do, because we can't do. It's not after all we have done. It's just there, period. Grace is there. Mercy is there. And if God wants more out of you, he'll whoop it into you. Amen? Amen. All right, now... Uh, Oh, now we're getting to the good part. Verse 16 again. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, who, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17. You've heard me quote that a jillion times. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So can a person be saved from a message, but not a Bible verse message? Can they be saved by a concert? At some point, the word of God is going to have to be there. And if it's not, I mean, let's say that a concert happens and there's a lot of good things said and somebody comes down and says they want to give their life to the Lord because they've, God's been dealing with them for a long time. I'm okay with that. As long as the word of God is presented at some point to them, it must be the word of God that saves them. And there is no replacement for that. Um, verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Where is that a quote from? Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no... Uh, anyway, that's all I remember. <laughs> There's no speech or language or their voice is not heard. Verse 19, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. That is us. We are Jacob inflaming Esau to jealousy. Esau seriously, so jealous over Jacob, he, he's going to kill him. Jacob, you better go, because if I see you out somewhere, I'm going to kill you. You took my birthright. You took my, my inheritance. You took my blessing. Jacob's saying, well, you shouldn't have been stupid. <laughs> hey, don't, you know, don't, don't blame me for your stupidity. But that's what happened. And so God definitely, now get this now. Here are the people, us, who the oracles were not given to, the Ten Commandments was not given to us, the law of God was not given to us, the commandments was not given to us. It was given to the seed of Abraham. It was given to the Jews. The people who met God at Mount Sinai was not the Gentiles, it was the Jews. Moses, the lawgiver, was the lawgiver for the Jews. David was the king of the Jews. Solomon was king of the Jews. Um, all of that given to the prophets by God was through the Jews. Us Gentiles, we don't have a heritage that goes back thousands of years of serving God. We served other gods. So God is going to use us who have had no history with God and no law, he's going to use us then to provoke 
Israel to jealousy. And I, I believe that's going to happen at the rapture. God is going to translate us visibly in front of the whole world and the Jews. And they're going to look at that. And they're going to know that God received us up to heaven to be with him. And they're thinking, that's our spot. And God's like, no, you lost your spot 2,000 years ago. However, have I got a deal for you. I won't give you their spot. I'll give you one twice as good as their spot. And a Jew never turns down a good deal. But we're going to provoke them to jealousy. They're going to say, how did God save these infidel Gentiles and not us law-keeping Jews? And God's going to say to them, they're going to understand, it's not by keeping the law. It's by grace through faith. Amen. But Isaiah is very bold. He saith, I was found among them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and a gainsaying people. Hmm. Now, chapter 11 in 10 minutes. That means I'll get to it in 10 minutes. No, chapter 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. God still saves Jews. Uh, a man that uh, has had a tremendous help in my life. Somebody that you don't know. I never mention them. I never say their name, but God knows who it is. There's a man that God used to help me years ago. And he is a Jew. And he was saved. And um, I mean, as soon as he was saved, he was like King James all the way. Well, I was struggling with it back then. And finally, God opened my eyes up to it, and I called him. He knew exactly what was going on and, and so on. But um, God still saves Jews, saved him. So God has not cast away his people, God forbid. Verse 2, God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Again, God has already seen the future. He knows what day, what hour, what minute, where they're going to be, when God opens their eyes to the gospel, God already has that day and that hour in mind. It's already there. So naturally, God is not going to, on the way there, change his mind or his heart about whether to save the Jews or not. Listen, he's already made the decision to do it. After thousands of years of knowing who they are, knowing what they're like, Knowing what great sins they're capable of, he's going to save them anyway. Uh, this became real to me one day. I was listening. We were at a camp meeting. I was hearing a preacher preach. And uh, God was just trying to help me along a little bit. I was feeling pretty down on myself. But the Holy Spirit just kind of like, Mike, don't you think that God knew all about you before he ever called you? And they went, yeah. He had to have. And by the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Yeah. So Mike, do you think God's sorry that he called you? Mm -mm. Not according to what I read. Now, part of my flesh wants to say yeah. But God's word says no. Amen. So... Verse, uh, verse 2 again. What, what ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. Dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Uh, what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. In this case, it's not 7,000, it's 144,000. It's 144,000 of 12,000 from each tribe, literally from each tribe, and to the number from each tribe, because God doesn't paraphrase. And he's picked exactly that many people. He already has them reserved, whether they're even born or not, he already has them reserved. And they are already God's people. And he is already their God. But he's reserved to himself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. 
Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of works. Nope. Grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. You understand that? If it's by grace, it can never be after all you have done. God doesn't measure it that way. What then, verse 7, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. As it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and now think of a, a person in the Bible whose eyes were dim. There's several of them in the Old Testament. Name one. Eli. Remember his eyes were dim? So he's Israel. And he finds out that the ark of God is taken. And what does he do? Fall backwards. Uh, Jacob. In blessing Manasseh and Ephraim. His eyes are dim. Okay, but he guided his hands wittingly, the Bible says. And Isaac. Uh, yeah, that. Let's see. Okay, yeah, Isaac. Yeah, he had to. That, that's weird to me. That Jacob, in order to make a reasonable attempt at mimicking Esau's hair, wraps his arm in goat fur. How much hair did he have? Huh? Yeah. And stinks. Uh, that's my son Esau. Stinks like goat. Yeah, your mama always tried to wash that off of you and wasn't good. So anyway, uh, you mentioned Samson. Boom. Okay. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see. And bow down their back all way. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come. Here it is. The doctrine of, of Israel plays into the salvation of us. Through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. There it is again, second time. Now if the fall of them, here it is. Here's Paul's logic. If the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So if God's saying, if them stumbling has brought benefit to the Gentiles, how much more they're arising from the dead, the Gentiles? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. In other words, Paul, even though he was done preaching to the, to the Jews in the synagogues, he didn't have a problem preaching and doing miracles and all kinds of things with the Gentiles. He didn't mind the Jews watching a good old-fashioned Gentile tent revival. Because the more of that that they saw, and they saw the, the, uh, the Gentiles come under the direction of the Holy Spirit, bow before God, worship the God of the, of the Jewish fathers, worship a Jewish Savior. He's going, the Jews at some point got to get mad over this. They got to get jealous over this. And so, um, verse 15, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first root be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now the root, in this case, and the tree is going to be Christ. Get that part straight. The, the tree and the root is not Hebrew roots. 
Don't, and I say this to y'all, but a lot of y'all online, do not let some idiot on social media convince you that the only way to understand the gospel is from a Jewish or Hebraic perspective. What's the problem in trying to understand the gospel like a Jew did? The Jew didn't understand the gospel. They didn't even understand the Messiah of the gospel. To them, it couldn't have been Christ, so it must be some other. So that, that just always, at first, years ago when I heard that, I'm going, well, you know, I guess that kind of makes sense. I, maybe I'm missing something, you know, maybe I need to study the Jewish roots of it or whatever. Now God said, no, Mike, don't go there. And now when I hear that being said, I'm going, that's a trap. That's a trap. If you follow that to its logical conclusion, you will be forced to following a different savior. Similar to how people read the book of Enoch and find these quote unquote messianic prophecies in there. Listen, God did not inspire Enoch to write a book. I don't believe he wrote one. Uh, but since it's not in the canon of our scriptures, meaning God didn't want it in, it means that any so-called prophecy in there is a false prophecy meant to lead people astray and not lead people to the gospel. But I, I mean, guys have done whole books on uh, the book of Enoch and its messianic prophecies and made big deal about it. Um, who's this guy, this rabbi that's kind of gotten famous? Um, trying to think, his, he's written several books and he's been on um, It's Supernatural with Sid Roth and Rabbi something, now. I can see his face, I can't remember his name. But he, um, there is something in the Kabbalah about um, a skull. And in the Kabbalah, they call it Golgotha, which is a, a variance of Golgotha. But basically, this guy took this, this thing out of the Zohar, this Kabbalistic book. And used it to try to show that the early Jewish rabbis actually believed in the cross. They just didn't know it. Because they were talking about some miracle that was going to take place at the skull. And they kept saying, the skull, the skull. And, and this rabbi is going, I, we know what that is. That's Golgotha. They're talking about Christ and the cross and Calvary. And, and the early Jewish rabbis, they knew this. And I'm going, no, they didn't. Those rabbis are in hell. Because they didn't believe the gospel. They came up with their own and put it in the Zohar. And that's crazy. But people went nuts over that. Oh man, that's so amazing. Boy, the way the Jews see this is far better. No, it's not. That's a trap. So he says here, very quickly, verse 17, or verse 16. The first root be holy, the lump is holy, and the root be holy, so are the branches. And if the branches be broken off, Meaning Israel, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. In other words, you're not holding the tree up. The tree's holding you up. And we have too many Christian preachers and theologians who believe that their teaching and their preaching and their doctrine is what's holding God's kingdom together. Well, if it hadn't been for Dr. So-and-so, we'd have just all fell apart years ago. I hate it. When I been, go to these camp meetings, and they go on men praising things. Oh, Dr. So-and-so did this. Oh, Brother So-and-so, he's here. Did, he's been here every year, faithful. 50 years he's been here preaching the good old God. And they make it sound like this guy is something other than a sinner saved by grace. And I, I went to a camp meeting several years ago. I made me so mad I was sick and I told my wife, I said, I'm, let's get out of here and I ain't never come and we never went back, ever. Thou wilt say then, verse 19, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. No, that's the same thing about Israel saying, well, God 
is taking those nations out because he wants me in there. No, God's taking those nations out because they're disobedient. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, Israel, the Jews, take heed lest he also spare not thee. You can get too cocky, too arrogant for God's use. You don't belong on that tree. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou what? Believe it for only 15 minutes, like this guy wrote on Facebook. I believe so much in eternal security, I could just believe the gospel for 15 minutes and I'm saved forever. That's what he wrote. No, you're tempting God's what you're doing. Then continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. What do you not understand about that? The tree is Christ. It's holy. Israel was taken off because of their disbelief. But if they believe, he is able to graft them in again, back into the same place. And so... Verse 24, for if thou wert cut off out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be natural branches be graft into their own olive tree? And then he says it right here, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that lest you should be wise in your own conceits. And he's referring to that teaching on the olive tree. The blindness in part has happened to Israel. Thus they were taken out until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now they're grafted in. Amen.